Good morning. How's everyone today? Great. Uh, so most of you know me fairly well by now because I've been working with you and we've been together for the past five days. Five? This, today's the fifth day, correct? Yes. Um, um, so I, just a little bit about myself. I actually didn't study media studies formally in university. I actually have a background in the social sciences. Um, I studied anthropology as an undergraduate and sociology as well, and then I got my uh, I have my MA also in sociology. So I approach media studies from a very um, sociological perspective. Um, uh, yes, and um, particularly this is part of the reason why I'm so interested in the intersection of media and gender, uh, because there's a lot that I th I feel sociology brings can bring to the table um, in terms of interdisciplinary understanding of media and gender. So let's jump right in. I want to frame this, so as a sociologist, I'm going to be um, you know, putting out a few um, social theories before, uh, or at the, to kind of frame the beginning of this lecture. So the first one that I want you to keep in mind as we go throughout the, uh, the course of the next hour and a half is um, a social theory called symbolic annihilation. And symbolic annihilation refers to the absence of representation or underrepresentation of some group of people in the media. Um, and I would argue, even if it's not absence of representation or underrepresentation, it also refers to the misrepresentation. So not only a lack of representation, but being representing in uh, not necessarily the correct way uh, that reflects reality by the media. Um, so this is a, um, a, a comic strip cartoon that I really feel kind of frames the issue quite well. Um, you obviously have two women, one on the left in the bikini saying everything's covered but her eyes. What a cruel male dominated culture. And on the right you have the woman in the niqab, uh, Abaya, saying nothing covered but her eyes. What a cruel male dominated culture. So playing on this idea that no matter what culture you are in, uh, in any society around the world, male patriarchal society is constantly uh, fretting and uh, worrying about the female body. There is constant attention to it. It's a constant battle over what is appropriate, inappropriate, acceptable, unacceptable, normal, not normal. Um, and as part of, as part of this um, patriarchal uh, hegemonic structure, the media you know, plays, plays a large role in upholding this kind of obsession. A perfect example came out just a few days ago. I'm sure you've all seen this image. I, you know, I posted it in, in a couple different forms on uh, our Facebook page. This you know, kind of sums up perfectly the obsession, the modern obsession with, with women's bodies um, until this day. And you know, so there was a lot of uh, debate about this. You know, oh, and, you know, some people were saying, oh, it's, it's such a great representation of what the Olympics is all about, bringing together cultures and people from different backgrounds under the um, you know, umbrella of sportsmanship and athleticism. Other people said, no, you know, this represents a culture clash and, you know, it, it, it represents the, the, the battle between East and West and uh, all of this kind of idea. The most frustrating thing is that we were, the media and the general population is so focused on not what these women are doing in terms of their athletic ability or their skills or their, you know, their, their skills in sports, they're talking about what they're wearing. Um, so again, focused on their bodies. And I'm curious to know if anybody in the room has any idea even who won this volleyball match. Yes, Carola? The Germans, okay, that's because we have a German in the room, yes? But that was not part, that was not the dominant discussion, right? No one was really concerned about how they're performing. They were concerned about, again, what they're wearing. So when it comes to normalizing gender, I'm gonna give you two more kind of social lenses through which to view um, the, the material that we're going to be looking at over the next hour and a half. Um, so when we construct gender, how do we define what gender is? We have two main theories um, that refer to this. So the first is social comparison theory. Basically, we define everything in life one way or another um, by comparing yourselves to others, right? So social comparison theory argues that in the absence of any other objective external benchmark, people define themselves by comparing themselves to other people in their environment. In addition, um, social and cultural values, especially from peer, parental, and media influences, and obviously 
given that this is a lecture on media, uh, we're going to focus particularly on the media influences, which have a tremendous effect on individual values and behaviors. Keeping that in mind, okay, uh, we also need to uh, consider how dominant media is. I don't think this is something that is shocking or surprising. Um, you are all very familiar with how uh, ubiquitous and how ever-present media is in our lives. Uh, so just to give you some, some little facts and figures here, the average person sees between four and 600 commercial messages, so what we refer to as advertisements, per day, per day. The average child will watch 5,000 hours of television and have, will have seen 80,000 ads by the time they start kindergarten, which is around age five. By age 17, that same child will have received over 250,000 commercial messages. And that's not, keeping, that's not taking into account all the other forms of entertainment media, whether it be you know, movies or internet or social media or radio or any other forms of media that they are consuming. So we have a situation then where the media very much defines our values and um, our frames of reference and how we understand the world. And at the same time, we are inundated with media left and right, right? We're constantly being bombarded with media messages. Um, so it's worthwhile to ask then, in terms of who is being portrayed, how are they being portrayed, the people that we see in the media? So I wanna talk about four uh, main stereotypes in media portrayal of women. And uh, these are what are Western stereotypes, but they apply as well to the Arab world. Um, but we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. So the four main stereotypes are, are the femme fatale, the, um, you know, the, the traditional la femme nikita, these kinds of roles where you know, the woman uses her sexual uh, attract attractiveness and her sexual prowess to lure a man in, uh, and then in some way to either use him or betray him, or she has ulterior motives. The super mom, right? The mother and wife who's, you know, spotless house, kids are happy, dinner's hot and on, on the table every day at the same time, um, no mistakes, everything is just always perfect. The sex kitten, so, you know, the, the object of sexual, of men's sexual desire, and the evil villainess, um, the Cruella de Vil type, you know, in every, almost every Disney movie, you have an evil villainess, so a woman who has power, uh, who, is, who has power because of her intellect, but that is being used for evil purposes. So, you know, if, if you want to contrast with the femme fatale, the femme fatale uses her physical prowess and her sexual attributes for evil purposes, whereas the evil villainess uses her intellect for, uh, for evil purposes. Um, in terms of uh, media portrayals of Arab women, and I put an asterisk, asterisk there because I want to um, highlight that these are, are Western um, portrayals of Arab women, they don't even get four we, I should say, uh, don't even get four, we get two, uh, when we are referred to in, in the Western media, which is the submissive, co submissive covered woman who's oppressed, who has no voice, and the exotic harem uh, belly dancer, you know, a seductive temptress who, you know, is somehow otherized and is, is uh, glamorized as this very exotic other. This is an ad that came out a few years ago by Diesel, which is a clothing brand. They're quite known for their jeans, trying to create some sort of mishmash between these two stereotypes. So uh, I'm not what I appear to be. So somehow a mishmash of the submissive covered woman on the one hand, yet at the same time exotic because she has half of her body showing and is covered in tattoos. We tend to think that these stereotypes only apply to entertainment media, but that is actually not the case. This is a graphic taken that shows um, the percentage of guests on, um, on talk shows on US cable news. And you can see that even, um, in, even on channels or on media outlets that are considered quite liberal, uh, so I kind of wish Moses was here because I have a figure about his favorite, you know, um, his favorite media source, which is Democracy Now. Um, even more liberal outlets, you can see that the percentage of male guests on um, on talk shows greatly outnumbers the number of female guests, and this implies that women are meant to be seen and not heard in media. So they might be visibly present but they, are not, they do not have a voice. So when we talk about then how do we, um, uh, sorry, 
So to get back to the idea of entertainment media, so uh, this, this kind of lack of representation permeates and, and um, extends across all forms of media. Uh, it's also, like I said, it's, it's not only entertainment media, it's also present in, in news, but in it's more, most stark in entertainment media. Um, males actually outnumber females nearly two to one in primetime TV, which means that for every male uh, for every one female character, there are two male characters. In the, in, in the 1970s, that ratio was three to one, so we have made some progress in putting more, in terms of having just numbers, um, having more women on uh, in entertainment media. In, in G-rated films, which are, you know, when we say G-rated, we mean like Disney films, animation films, uh, films for children, the, the numbers are 2.5 to one. So women are still, um, you know, half as present as men in entertainment media. And when we do see women, how are they portrayed? So I'm going to be talking about a couple different categories of normalizing gender and, and particularly beauty for, for women in, in, and how they are represented in the media. Obviously the first criteria is thinness. Uh, women are getting thinner and thinner. This is a, a graphic that shows kind of the, an image that shows the, the how beauty ideals have changed over time. And while there are some exceptions, you know, in, in the 1960s, the, um, the body image was quite healthy. You had the, you know, the beauty icons like Marilyn Monroe, who were quite voluptuous in comparison to today's standards. Um, and progressively throughout the decades, women and beauty, ideal, beauty idols have become thinner and thinner and thinner. Nowadays, we do have some you know, examples of women who don't fit these particular uh, ideals and who are challenging the, the, the um, traditional, or if you want, the stereotypical uh, idea of thinness. You think of people like Kim Kardashian or um, Sofia Vergara from uh, Modern Family, or in the Arab world, women like Haifa Wahbe, right? She's very sexy, but at the same time, she's not super, super skinny. Um, Having said that, the, um, the standard is still, the industry standard is still to have women who are very, very, very thin. Um, and these women actually have a skewed body mass index. BMI is a, body mass index is a uh, measurement that um, is calculated by looking at the ratio of height to weight. So uh, a normal healthy BMI is anywhere between 18 and 25. These women all have uh, body mass indexes of 17, which is technically considered anorexic. And when you compare this to what normal women actually look like, these are women with healthy body mass indexes of 18 to 25. So you can see the stark contrast between what the media tells us is the ideal and what reality actually is. Um, and sorry, I, I should have said this at the beginning of the lecture. I will be using quite a few um, risque images and images of women who are partially nude. Uh, we're all adults, and you can't really talk about women's bodies unless we actually show women's bodies. So why is this an issue? That there's this, this disconnect between what the media shows us is an ideal and what is actual reality. Well, a young woman actually, so to show the, the, how in, unattainable and how um, unrealistic these standards are, a young woman has a 7% chance of being as slim as a catwalk model and a 1% chance of being as thin as a supermodel. On television, over three quarters of female characters in the sitcoms are underweight, three quarters. That's 75%, 70 per, 75% on women on, in, of women on television are underweight and only one in 20 are above average in size. When it comes to women who are above average in size, the uh, media attention and the discussion, public discussion about those, those uh, actresses or care, um, women in, in the public eye tends to focus disproportionately on their weight, right? Did they gain weight? Did they lose weight? Oh, there is a transformation. How did she lose the 20 pounds? Get her secrets, this kind of idea. Um, and they are constantly, so they are constantly being reminded about their size, and they are usually typecast into comedic roles. They don't get serious drama roles. They don't get serious acting roles. They're, they're there for comic relief, and so the message is that fat equals funny, but not to be taken seriously. 
The second category we want to talk about when we, come, when we speak of normalizing beauty is youthfulness. Um, female characters, overwhelmingly, uh, in entertainment media in the West are younger than male characters. Males are twice as likely as females to be 50 to 60 years old. We also need to look at the idea of appearance versus brains. So I want to give you just one example, but I mean there are obviously plenty. Um, this is um, a journalist that uh, is, she's still working in the US media news industry and she moved from CNN to Fox News in 2002. Her name is Greta Van Susteren. Um, and when she got the job offer at Fox News, they basically asked her, they said, yeah, you know, it's great. We would love to have you come work for us. But, you know, there's just a little bit of a problem with your look, you know. You just, we need to, to make some, some changes. Um, and so she agreed, and she actually ended up having plastic surgery and having a whole makeover. And so this, the left picture is Greta Van Susteren before 2002, and this is her after 2002. So you can see the dramatic um, makeover that, that she had, almost as if she's part of one of those, you know, um, reality shows where you have the before and after transformation. In the, we also have this issue in the Arab world. Um, Arab anchors are either getting younger or appearing to get younger uh, through the help of surgical modification and all of these procedures. Um, so younger, thinner, and more focused on, on their appearances. It's almost part of, the, not it is almost, it is part of the criteria in the Arab world that if you want to work for, if you want to be on TV, you have to have a certain look. You need to be thin, you need to be beautiful, you need to have long hair and proper makeup and more often than not, some sort of level of revealing clothing as well. Um, this is also problematic. Uh, Jad and I recently, um, uh, well not recently, we are continuously working on studies of gender in the news industry um, and looking at particularly at female journalists and these are some statistics that um, came out of the last study that we did. So when it comes to who's studying media and journalism, there's a four to one ratio. So for every young man studying journalism or communications or media, uh, there are four women. So, and if that's fairly, um, it's, it's not really surprising. If you look at the demographics or the breakdown of even our group, right, there are overwhelmingly more women than there are men. But when it comes to actually getting jobs in the news industry, that ratio goes from, it actually flips in favor of men one to two. So for every one uh, female, there are two males working in the news industry. In Lebanon, um, in the news industry, the management uh, of the news industry, only 22% are women. And boards and ownership, only 15% of women. So I wanna put a question out to you then. Why does this matter? Why does it matter that the, the, the that management and ownership are so, that women are so um, absent in ownership and management positions in the news industry in Lebanon. Yes, Don. Can we get the mic? The issue is that if you want to really change the industry, if you want to change how women are presented, you, it, if the, if the managers and the ownerships are mainly dominated, they're not going to care to change, to fundamentally change those things because at the end of the day, it brings them revenue. So that's why you really need women in the management who are active, who can change it from the inside, who can change the rules, who can change the regulations and add new ones. Absolutely, I couldn't have said it better myself. So the, the idea is that you need more women, if you don't have women in positions and decision-making positions, then the concerns of women and the portrayal of women are not accurately reflected. Moving on to another genre of media, video games, right? The final frontier of media, as I like to call it, because it's a multi-billion dollar industry and for the longest time, most people didn't take video game video game industry or people who played video games very seriously. That is changing as we're seeing how ubiquitous they become, how popular video games are. It's no longer just boys and men playing video games. Um, you know, the, the profile of gamers has changed. Um, like I said, it is a multi-billion dollar industry with a lot of financial, um, uh, a lot of financial incentive and a lot of financial um, implications. So when it comes to video games, only one in seven characters of the best-selling video games are women. And this is not surprising. Think about the most popular video games. Generally have to do with sports, 
fighting, um, war, uh, racing. So, and, and these are not, these are very male dominated areas. When women do appear in video games, however, 40% of those reveal, were revealing clothing or were partially or totally nude. So this image of this woman on the bottom is, is, very, is very, a very common thing to, to, uh, to see when in portrayals of women in video games. I want to move on now to the idea of uh, another attribute of normalizing beauty, which is portraying women as sex objects. Um, so female body parts in America sell everything from food to cars. So this ad on the left um, is for a, a fast food restaurant in the US called Carl's Jr. So you're basically using a semi-naked woman to sell a cheeseburger. Uh, the, the ad on the right, I'm not sure if you can see the text, but it's, it says, you know you're not the first, but do you really care? And it's an ad for used for Aston Martin pre-owned or used cars. So playing on this, uh, this idea of the used car and the used woman. But it's so, it's so beautiful that you don't care that you're not, you're not the first to have it. Female body parts in Lebanon sell everything from walls to cable to television. So these two ads on the left are for, um, for a local mall called City Mall, um, which is supposed to be a family-friendly environment. Um, and here the idea is that, yes, if you come to our mall, you will have sexy, sexy security guards making sure that you, you are safe while you are at our, are at our mall. The ad on the right is for Cablevision, which is a cable, cable television provider here in Lebanon. And here they are literally using the woman as a woman's chest as a billboard for the different brands, for the different television, uh, television um, networks that you can get through their, through their um, pr provider. To Lottery, it, almost, it, it seems almost unbelievable that an ad like this can be made. This is from, I believe, 2014. <laughs> Um, and you know it, it's quite flagrant and quite in your face. There was a lot of backlash by um, local women's rights group and feminists and activists and the one or two media watchdog groups that we do have in the country. They were very upset at, at, at this ad and it was quickly taken down um, and pulled from circulation. Um, you know, and, and uh, women's body parts are also you know used to with this idea of of, of slavery, this is an ad for Louis Vuitton where they're selling handbags, but you can see how the women are equally on display uh, on par with the handbags. So you can buy a handbag and you can also buy a half-naked woman. Um, so I wanted, the first video, I'll be showing you a lot of videos throughout the next hour, um, and the first video that I want to show you is a campaign called Women Not Objects that was um, a campaign aimed at the Cannes, the Cannes Film Festival to um, get rid of, to, to not promote these kinds of objectifying advertisements towards uh, the, the, uh, uh, ads that objectify women.
this shirt looks too good for pants. Peekaboo, like what you see? Okay, and so, you know, speaking of, speaking of the ability of, um, you know, campaigns to go viral, this, uh, the hashtag women not objects right after this video was released blew up on Twitter. Um, it became very popular. Uh, a lot of people started tweeting about their experiences with objectification and how the media industry and particularly the advertising industry really needs, needs to change. Um, and you know, so it, was, it has been quite a successful campaign. So they started out with just this one video, but it has been, you know, it's been picked up and other people have picked up on this hashtag women not objects and have continued to, um, you know, to push the issue. I'm going to show you some more videos now from, from Lebanon. Uh, the first is a, the, uh, an advertising campaign from 2009 created by the Lebanese Ministry of Tourism. So keep that in mind. This is an official, um, the, an official advertisement for tourism in, in Lebanon that is shown on Middle East Airlines. There's a more updated version of it now. I'm not sure if any of you have flown on, on MEA into Beirut Airport, but this is basically when you land, uh, when you're flying into Beirut Airport, this is what everybody in the plane sees, including children. So provocatively dressed women dancing on tables, alcohol, partying, close-up shots of breasts and buttocks and women dancing provocatively with men. Okay, and then, yes, they move on. They do move on to other things. So we have other things in Lebanon besides sexy women. We have gambling and plastic surgery, and you can also buy some jewelry if you're interested. But the majority of the, this, you know, uh, this video, or this, um, sorry, this, this advertisement for come to Lebanon, this is what we have to offer, is sexy women. Um, I saw another campaign that was done in 2011, also by the Ministry of Tourism. <laughs> Is these are formal? Yes, these are done by the Ministry of Information and the Ministry of Tourism, and they're you know they've gi they're given the thumbs up. Hey. Hi. So tell me, how was your holiday? Okay. So it was that good, was it? Anyway, they need to be checked before tomorrow. sitting in his office back at work and some you know his boss gives him some some images of a woman in a bikini to, to add to the layout and automatically oh woman in bikini oh you know automatically taken back to back to you know the, the women the Lebanese women the scantily clad Lebanese women and um, again there was a backlash here we go um, there was backlash against did I close it Um, there was a um, public backlash against these ads. A again, a lot of women's rights groups did call out the Ministry of Tourism and said, you are not portraying Lebanon in a very great way. I mean, we have more than, this, we have much more to offer. And so, 
Um, in the past few years, the, the, the Ministry of Tourism and the Ministry of Information have focused more on ecotourism, on the natural landscapes of Lebanon, on the hospitality of the people, of you know, sharing meals and events and um, you know, cultural, more, more cultural aspects of Lebanon as opposed to just come to the naked women. Okay, moving on to music videos in the Arab world, particularly in Lebanon. Um, music videos tend to more or less basically be softcore pornography. Uh, these are two stills taken from recent music videos. The one on the left, um, this, I can't remember her name, but she's the sister of Haifa Wahbe. Most of you know who Haifa Wahbe is, correct? Yes, you've heard of Haifa, Haifa Wahbe? She's one of the most famous uh, Lebanese singers but um, I felt that she is quite well known, so I chose some other examples. And you can see she's in a very sexually uh, submissive position, um, also acting like a, a baby, uh, uh, licking a, a large lollipop, um, but, but also all being very provocatively dressed. The uh, bottom right photo is another uh, Lebanese singer named Miriam Klink, um, and uh, I will show you two examples of these types of music videos and how um, how derogatory they are, they are to women. The interesting part, <laughs> well, let me show you the first one and then, I'll sh and then we'll talk about, and I'll make my comment. So, so you get the idea, right? And the, the upsetting part is it's not a, a man putting, telling, making her do this. She is doing this to herself and she's choosing to do it. And a lot of feminists in the country have called her out and women's rights groups are saying, you are giving Lebanese women a very bad name. You're sending very bad messages to women and to young girls that this is what is ex ex expected and is acceptable. And she, you know, she's defended herself. She says, I'm a beautiful woman. I have nothing to hide. This is how I promote myself. And this is just me. If you don't like it, don't watch it. And then you have uh, the, and so this is not only pervasive in the videos of female singers in, there, in, in Lebanon, it's also pervasive in, uh, even more pervasive, I would say, um, in video clips of, of male singers. Uh, it, what's interesting is that this, this is a very popular song that I'm about to play right now. Almost every time I go to the beach, um, they are playing it and everyone is just singing along and I look at the women and I just kind of smile I'm like I wonder I, have they seen the music video because it is extremely um, derogatory so obviously the sexual the sexual innuendo is very clear um, and he refers to her you know so a taste of peace uh, literally referring to women's body as meat, as if she's a cow, um, you know, so it's as if it's almost as if, you know, a piece of steak. Um, and this is the same man who also wrote another song saying that, you know, um, he wants a woman who's going to take her university degree and hang it in the kitchen. Um, so he, he is quite a character. Okay, obviously, you know, the situation is different in other Arab countries uh, that have more conservative um, norms and stricter rules on, on what can and cannot be shown in the media. So this is an example of a technology magazine called T3, and the original uh, image as published is on the left. In more conservative Gulf countries in particular, uh, they do tend to cover up body parts more. Um, but, like I said, I wanted to uh, the, the two stereotypes that I talked about before um, in terms of how the Western media portrays Arab women is either the submissive covered uh, woman 
or the exotic harem. In the Arab world, we have two portrayals of women, which is either um, the wife and the mother, or the sex object, the, you know, the, the, uh, a woman who exists for, um, for the, the pleasure of men. So um, to move to, the, to um, you know, a, a stereotype that's common of women in both the West and the Arab world is the idea of domesticity. So woman, woman is wife and mother. Um, these are two ads. The first one on the left is from the 1950s. It's for a brand of ties. And uh, the text says, show her, it's a man's world. And you have the, the housewife bringing him back, bringing the man back breakfast in bed. So the idea that if you wear this tie, it will you know help remind uh, the woman of her place in in the home. The ad on the right is from 2013, and it's an ad here in Lebanon for a electronics uh, store that sells um, house, house um, sorry electronics for the house. Um, and so the text says, cross your mother's mind twice a day, buy one washing machine and get a free vacuum cleaner because what every mother wants for Mother's Day is to do more laundry and more housework. Um, another ad from Lebanon, I believe this one was in 2014, uh, also for a, a store that sells um, house, household appliances uh, called Khuri Home. It says, chocolates make her fat, give unexpected gifts this Valentine's. Again, implying that what a woman wants for Mother's Day is to do is more appliances to do more housework, and you know these kinds of ads play on the basically send the message to women and to men to society in general that a woman's most important or even only meaningful role in society is that of wife and mother. And again, like like Jad was saying, um, you know earlier on in the week, when when we say these things, we're not saying there's anything wrong with being a wife and a mother or being a housewife, if that's what a woman wants to do. But those are not, they shouldn't be the only portrayals that women see, and the message being that that is the only value that a woman has to society is, is within these very constrained roles. الحين حيوروني اذا فعلا يحتاج مسحوق اكثر ولا لا، وحيبدا التحدي، ام فيصل حتغسل القميص بمكيال واحد من تاج الجديد بالحركات البرتقاليه، ام عبد الكريم بمكيالين من مسحوق. اولادهم حيلبسوا قميصين وحيطلعوا فوق هذا البياض. وحيوقفوا عند هذا البياض يلا كمان كمان خلاص وقف وقف الفرق واضح، تاج الجديد يوصلك لقمه البياض ما هي بنظافه نص نص. مبروك ام فيصل. So you know, sending the message to women that if if uh, you make sure that your child, your children's and your husband's clothing are as clean as possible, that you know you've succeeded at, at being a woman, um, and that if if not, uh, there's something fundamentally wrong with you as 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 a human being because you are unable to get the shirt or the you know the shirt extra clean. Um, and this goes for all cleaning products. And I mean, this is just one example, right? Every, every, every cleaning brand, whether it's uh, across the board or cleaning appliance, is always marketed in the same way uh, to, to the housewife. Another aspect that we want to look at is the idea of, uh, in media, is the idea of male dominance versus female submission. So the ad on the left is for a shoe, shoe polish uh, from the 1970s. Uh, Know, and the woman is looking at the shoe as if, oh, you know, obviously the very, very shiny shoe. Um, and the text says, keep her where she belongs. Um, so down at the man's feet, worshipping the man. Fast forward 45 years. Um, obviously very different in composition and quality, but the body positioning and the message is still the same. Um, you know, the woman, the woman at the man's feet, worshiping the shoes, um, and in a very submiss submissive, submissive position. Another aspect that we want to look at is the idea of in, when it comes to normalizing beauty, is plasticness. And Lebanon is, you know, the mecca of the Middle East when it comes to plastic surgery. Um, the plastic industry is a huge, uh, you know, a, hu a huge, uh, huge industry in the country, and. My research, I, I actually did my, my master's research on, um, on the plastic surgery industry in Lebanon, and um, while actual statistics are not, uh, it's, it's difficult to find hard statistics, 
uh, what we are able to find, what we were able to find is that anywhere between 60 to 70 percent of Lebanese women have had some form of plastic surgery, if not multi multiple surgeries. So there is this national obsession with the look and the image and perfecting the body. Um, so the, you know, the ad on the top playing with the national obsession with image, it's for a cos uh, cosmetics and fragrances store. The one underneath it, uh, plastic surgery being used to sell alcohol. The ad says plastic surgery made me fabulous. I'm not really f fully understanding how having plastic surgery is connected to a whiskey in any way or what the creative, uh, the creative direction of that ad was. And the third one at the bottom is for a local uh, chain restaurant called Crepe Away um, that says, come as you are. So using plastic surgery to sell food with the idea that, you know, even if you just had a nose job, you're more than welcome to come as you are and, and, and enjoy our food. This advertisement is specifically for uh, a, plastic, a plastic surgeon named Danny Nasser. Uh, so playing on the idea that a woman's body is like a building, it's like a construction site, so we have to constantly work on it and improve it, right, under construction. Get, got the chest, get the breast. So moving on to this idea that these normalizations of beauty and these categories, whether it's the thinness or the, the, the you know, being thin and young and hypersexualized, on top of it all is the idea that these, these uh, ideals are unattainable. Um, these idealized bodies are often impossible to attain. Um, this is just one of many examples. This woman on the, uh, is named Philippa Hamilton. She was a, um, a model for Ralph Lauren. And these are her metrics. So she was 178 centimeters, 54 kilograms, and a size 36, which is thin. <laughs> but she was told that she needed to be thinner. And they actually decided to make her thinner with Photoshop. And she was actually fired. She was let go from Ralph Lauren because they told her that um, she was too big to fit into the clothes anymore. So what, is, what effect do this exposure to such idealized body images, like what are the effects of, of, of such exposure to such media images? Studies show that um, you know, exposure to such idealized body images lead to lower self-worth in women. People who are shown slides of thin models had lower self-evaluations than those who were shown average or oversized models. Most girls in, in studies report that very thin models make them feel more insecure about themselves. One in four college-aged women use unhealthy methods of weight control, whether it's anorexia or bulimia or skipping meals or excessive exercise. Um, you know, and to the, this idea that media is promoting unhealthy ideals and it's become even more pervasive with the, the expansion of social media because now it's not just on television and on, uh, or in magazines or in movies, it's everywhere we go, right? How much time do we spend on the internet per day? those who have it don't see it. Help them find help. So the idea is that, you know, we can, some people say, oh, you know, you're making such a big deal out of it. What's the big deal if we're showing, if, if the media shows body images and shows um, examples of women that are unattainable, the, these, the media, <laughs> what is shown in the media does actually have very serious health implications and public health uh, issues. Um, so the idea is that, you know, we need to keep in mind of all of these images that we've looked at. Um, they don't represent the ideal, uh, sorry, they, they, they represent the ideal, but they don't represent the norm. And on top of that, 
pretty practically every single image and video that we see has undergone some sort of manipulation and extensive beautification, right? And we know this. This is um, this is kind of a benefit that I would say. I mean, I was I gave this lecture to the high school the high school students that were with us yesterday, some local high school students that were participating in MD Lab, and I was actually quite surprised at how um, how aware they are of all this they're like yeah this is this is not shocking we know all about this we're fully aware and you know the the generation now they know that things are being photoshopped and things are being edited and that even moving images even video in post-production you can go in and move wrinkles remove wrinkles you can make the hair different colors it's incredible what the technology can do but you know it's still important to remind uh, each other and to remind especially young women that what they see isn't how it actually is, that everything has really, um, every single image that we see has, has to some extent been, been manipulated. So I'm gonna show you two examples, shoot two videos that illustrate this example quite well. Introducing the next revolution in beauty. Get ready to experience a whole new you. It's you, perfected. Say goodbye to fine lines and wrinkles and hello to full lips, sparkling eyes, and lashes that never end. And that's just the beginning. Transform your look the way celebrities do with this beauty industry secret that's now available for the first time ever. Introducing Photoshop by Adobe. Finally look the way you've always dreamed. The difference is clear. Just one application of Photoshop can give you results so dramatic they're almost unrealistic. Use Healing Brush to target blemishes at their source by simply erasing them. ProPixel Intensifying Botanical Hydrodragon Microbead Extract infused with nutritive volumizing technology will leave your face virtually unrecognizable. My skin feels like plastic! Take control of your color with hue saturation. Use this breakthrough formula to change hair or skin color, brighten eyes, whiten teeth, even adjust your race. Tired of fighting with your shape? Wish you could be a total knockout? Dial in the perfect you with Liquify. Reshape your body without the expense and mess of surgery. Why eat healthy and exercise when you can just look like you do? And the best part is, it won't rub off. The results don't lie. Pictures like this are all Photoshop. The celebrity beauty secret used in virtually every major magazine is now available to you. You don't have to rely on a healthy body image or self-respect anymore. Now that's the power of Photoshop. There's only one way to look like a real cover girl. Photoshop by Adobe. So clearly making fun of Adobe Photoshop, right? And uh, how, how extensive the kinds of changes can be. Um, here's another one that is uh, a little more serious. Even after two and a half hours, at least two, two, two and a half hours in makeup and hair and all of, um, you know, getting all the traditional things done, then in post-production, obviously, um, all of these modifications can be made to even stretch necks. I mean, you know, they literally grabbed her entire head and, and, and made her, her neck longer. So it, it can be quite extreme. So when we look at these different standards and, and the fact that the 
the standards are so different from the norm, uh, we need to ask why, right? And I don't think, I think pretty much everybody can figure out what the answer is to sell people things, right? If you feel insecure about yourself and if you're, you're, the messages that you're being told that you constantly need to work on yourself and you constantly need to improve, then it makes it, easy, it, it, it easier to sell products to you that will help you fix all the things that are wrong with you. Um, you know, the diet industry alone, and that's not even keeping, that's not even taking into consideration cosmetics or um, makeup or um, any other products. Just the diet industry alone is worth $100 billion a year a third of which goes to advertising. So the message is basically that women, and increasingly men, and don't worry for the men in the room if you're starting to feel left out, I'm going to get to you soon, um, always need adjustment. A woman's body is an object to be perfected. And like I said, uh, feeding such insecurities, it leads to increased consumption, which leads to increased profits for companies. I'm a forensic artist. Worked for the San Jose Police Department from 1995 to 2011. I showed up to a place I'd never been, and there was a guy with a drafting board. We couldn't see them, they couldn't see us. Tell me about your hair. I didn't know what he was doing, but then I could tell after several questions that he was drawing me. Tell me about your chin. It kind of protrudes a little bit, hmm. especially when I smile. Your jaw? My mom told me I had a big jaw. What would be your most prominent feature? I kind of have a fat, rounder face. The older I've gotten, the more freckles I've gotten. I would say I have a pretty big forehead. Once I get a sketch, I say thank you very much, and then they leave. I don't see them. All I had been told before the sketch was to get friendly with this other woman, Chloe. Today I'm going to ask you some questions about a person you met earlier and I'm going to ask you some general questions about their face. She was thin so you could see her cheekbones and her chin, it was a nice thin chin. She had nice eyes, they lit up when she spoke. Cute nose. She had blue eyes, very nice blue eyes. So here we are. <laughs> this is the sketch that you helped me create and that's a sketch that somebody described of you so yeah that's She looks closed off and fatter, sadder too. Mm -hmm. The second one looks more open, friendly, and happy. Mm -hmm. I should be more grateful of my natural beauty. It impacts the choices and the friends that we make, the jobs we apply for, how we treat our children. It impacts everything. It couldn't be more critical to your happiness. Do you think you're more beautiful than you say? Yeah. We spend a lot of time as women analyzing and trying to fix the things that aren't quite right. And we should spend more time appreciating the things that we do like. So this is, this is a PSA slash ad campaign done, done by Dove, um, which is a company that sells beauty products. So um, it's interesting that juxtaposition because a lot of people have criticized, a lot of people said, you know, this is great. It is great to see that, um, you know, a cosmetics company or a company that makes uh, beauty products is realizing that we need to change the way we, we um, address women. But at the same time, a lot of people have, have said it's hypocritical because you're playing on people's emotions and trying to tell them you're, mu more, you're more beautiful than you think but you should still buy our products to make yourself the, the most beautiful, the most natural beautiful you can be. Okay. So switching the conversation and 
moving to the other 50% of the world's population, <laughs> what are the major, the co most common media portrayals of men? Again, there are four main stereotypes. We have the, the Superman, the tough guy, the badass, you know, uh, very, very strong and physically capable. We have the suave womanizing professional, uh, typified by, you know, roles such as Don Draper in Mad Men or shows like Entourage, um, you know, so the idea of the the very successful professional who's also able to, um, you know, is, is, very, is considered very attractive to women. The lazy slash dumb incompetent father. Um, so he's a father figure, but he's kind of bumbling and he's kind of an idiot and, you know, he tries to help do the laundry once and he ruins the entire, all the clothes and breaks the washing machine and the nerd slash geek slash loser who somehow still manages to get the girl uh, in the end. So beyond these four stereotypical representations of men, we need to ask what's problematic about normalizing manual, uh, masculinity. So I, I mentioned earlier that you know, these unrealistic body images increase the likelihood of eating disorders in young women and unhealthy um, body image. Men also suffer from anorexia. Um, they actually made a portmanteau out of it. So man plus anorexia equals manorexia. Um, and on the flip side as well, bigger, bigorexia. Um, so bigorexia is a form of muscle dysmorphia with, you know, that, fo that um, basically describes the obsession with obtaining the perfectly masculine body. So the idea of, you know, you need to be very buff and sculpted and big muscles. Um, a study done in, I believe, in 2012 by Dr. Dr. Milky and uh, Evelyn Hitti found that 42.1% per of, of gym goers use supplements, whether they be steroids, creatine, or protein. And these kinds of supplements have a slew of negative uh, side effects. I'm not going to read them all off, or maybe I should for the translation. I'll just read some of them. So everything is, um, you know, benign as acne um, to, you know, more problematic things like kidney and liver failure, um, reduced sperm count, enlargement of the heart, cardi cardiovascular problems, elevated aggression, psychiatric disorders. And the interesting thing about this study um, is that what, you know, these statistics say one thing, but when, when they asked women <laughs> what they find attractive in men, <laughs> women were not interested in the big muscles. So, you know, men are consuming media that men in Lebanon, particularly, you know, gym goers, look at these kinds of, um, the, the magazines of weightlifters and everything, and they think that that's what is the ideal, um, and that, that's what women want, but in fact, women are not interested at all um, in that type of, that type of look. Men are also objectified in advertising and in the media. So this is uh, using a shirtless man to sell air freshener. The ad says, look at this gorgeous air freshener next to this gorgeous man. And 90% of the ad is taken up by the shirtless man. You know, the actual product is given very, very little attention. When it comes to normalizing uh, masculinity and, and gender, uh, the male gender, um, I want to talk a bit of a, about a topic that is still relatively under, under uh, investigated and it's um, a, a future field of research that has really, really just started to get attention in the past five to ten years. Um, this idea called toxic masculinity. Um, and I'll just read this quote for you that I found very, that, you know, s sums up the idea of toxic masculinity very well. Um, media messages encourage boys to be competitive, focus on external success, rely on their intellect, withstand physical pain, and repress their vulnerable emotions. When boys violate the code, it is not uncommon for them to be teased, shamed, or, rid or ridiculed. And I would argue that this speaks equally to boys and masculinity and men in the West as equally as it does in the Arab world, as equally as it does in China, or Australia, or Africa, or anywhere in the world. So I'm going to show you the trailer of a documentary that came out in 2014, I believe, called The Mask You Live In, and it, it tackles this issue of how toxic masculinity is harmful and how media, how the media is contributing to the perpetuation of this, uh, this idea of tox toxic masculinity. Mm. 
Stop crying. Stop with the tears. Don't cry. Pick yourself up. Stop with the emotion. Don't be a pussy. Don't let nobody disrespect you. Be cool and be kind of a dick. Always keep your mind. Nobody likes a tattletale. Bros come before the hoes. Don't let you women run your you life. You bitch. What a fag. Get laid. Do something. Be a man. Be a man. Grow some balls. The three most destructive words that every man receives when he's a boy is when he's told to be a man. We've constructed an idea of masculinity in the United States that doesn't give young boys a way to feel secure in their masculinity. So we make them go prove it all the time. Within their peer group culture, each of them is posturing based on how the other boys are posturing. And what they end up missing is what they each really want, which is just that closeness. In good times, guys are like really close to each other. But when things get a little bit worse, you're on your own. From middle school, I had four really close friends. But once I kind of went into high school, I struggle finding people I can talk to because I feel like I'm not supposed to get help. Our kids get up every morning. They have to prepare their mask for how they're going to walk to school. A lot of our students don't know how to take the mask off. What is it you don't let people see? Almost 90% of you have pain and anger on the back of that paper. If you never cry, then you have all these feelings stuffed up inside of you, and then you can't get them out. They really buy into the, a culture that doesn't value what we've feminized. If we're in a culture that doesn't value caring, doesn't value relationships, doesn't value empathy, you are going to have boys and girls, men and women, go crazy. I had anger issues in high school. I felt like an outcast. I've been suspended at least once every year I was here. We would just look for trouble and just like try to fight. Boys are more likely to act out. They're more likely to become aggressive. Most people miss that as depression or see it as a conduct disorder, or just a bad kid. I felt like just giving up on life. You know, I actually had suicide thought to my head at sixth grade. I felt alone for, for a long time, and I actually thought about killing myself. Whether it's homicidal violence or suicidal violence, people resort to such desperate behavior only when they are feeling shamed and humiliated or feel they would be if they didn't prove that they were real men. If you're told from day one, don't let nobody disrespect you, and this is the way you handle it as a man, respect is linked to violence. If I can man up, why step down from that, you feel me? It's like instinct. I was going to end this hyper masculine narrative here. So obviously this is an exploration of masculinity in American culture, but like I just said, I argue, I would argue that this is the, a pervasive issue that is present everywhere around the globe. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really time to change the conversation. I mean, we, as, as someone who is half American and grew up in the US, we've you know, had this slew of mass shootings. It's like every time you turn around, there's another, uh, there's another mass shooting and they are always the same profile. Young men who have felt that they are not being taken seriously, that they don't have an outlet to express themselves, to express their pain and their frustration and their anger. And as, you know, as the, the expert in the video said, they equate respect with violence because this is what the media shows and portrays and tells them is, is an acceptable way to, to, to gain respect. And so I wanna give you some statistics that talk about the public health implications of toxic masculinity. Um, so studies show that men die younger, up to 10 years younger than women, and it's not because of some genetic difference, it's because men don't take care of themselves. When men get sick, they are less likely to go to the doctor and to seek help. They are less, and when they do go seek medical uh, attention, they are less likely to follow uh, the, the, the proper care and the proper steps that the doctors uh, prescribe. Men are twice as likely than women to suffer from rage disorders. They are more likely to abuse alcohol, drugs, and engage in risky behavior, such as driving, very, driving too fast or not wearing a seat belt or um, you know, taking, taking dangerous risks. They are more likely to kill and be killed. This is a life or death situation, okay? 90% of all murders are committed by men. At the same time, 77% of murder victims are men. And men account for 80% of suicides. 
although we don't talk about that, right? We talk about women in depression a lot. We don't talk about men in depression. I see people taking pictures. I'll wait. Okay. Toxic masculinity also fuels and contributes to rape culture and gender violence. So here we're kind of coming full circle and trying to understand how the portrayal of both women and men um, overlap in, in, a certain, in a certain context. So these are all um, fashion ads that show obviously uh, borderline sexually violent uh, portrayals of men and women. So women in, in positions where they're being physically pinned down to the ground or uh, carried away by a group of men uh, for some nefarious purposes. What do we mean when we talk about rape culture? Uh, rape culture refers to uh, jokes, TV, music, advertising, legal jargon, laws, words, and imagery that make violence against women and sexual coercion seem so normal that people believe that rape is inevitable. Um, and the persistence of rape becomes just the way things are. And we've had a, a, a fluctuating debate in Lebanon about this topic because we don't have laws that criminalize rape. Um, if, a, if a rapist uh, offers to marry his victim, then he is no longer considered guilty of a crime. So it's not just a problem in, in, in Western countries. Uh, to, to give you some statistics that come um, out, of, out of the US, some, some facts on rape in the US, only 20% of, of reported rapes are prosecuted. So that means that 80% of rapes end up going un, unpunished. 50% 50, 50 of all rapes are not even reported. So half of, half of rape victims end up not even uh, reporting to the, to the authorities their, the, the, the assault or the rape that they experience. Only 3% of rapes lead to jail time for rapists. And even at the institutional level in, within the U.S. military, 20, only 25% of rapes that occur in the U.S. military are prosecuted, and half of those result in any convictions. So the, the idea is basically that rape is just part of society, and it's just something that we need to deal with, and we should get over it. Um, I found th this graphic I find very useful in kind of explaining the, the different levels of um, the, the, what's called, it's called the pyramid of, of sexual violence and of gender violence. So, you know, people like to make jokes and in the media there are a lot of uh, references and jokes and off-color, uh, taste, uh, tasteless jokes about rape and about violence against women. Um, you know, so people will say, oh, it's just a joke. Why do you care so much? Well, the, the, the fact is, is that sexual violence exists in a pyramid and jokes and making light of rape and, and gender violence contributes to an overall culture of violence. So if you can joke about something on one level, then it follows step by step. You know, if you can make a joke about it, then it, and that's acceptable, then you know, it's also acceptable to make a, a comment that could be considered harassment or verbal abuse. And this is something that, it, um, I, you know, I don't know, I, I know it's a huge problem in Egypt. Um, I am not sure about other Arab countries. It's a huge problem in Lebanon. Um, I mean, on a daily basis, even our own police officers will make comments as you walk down the street, like, Shuya Ashto, and these are the people who are supposed to be protecting us and keeping us safe from, from male violence, and yet they are contributing to it as well. And so this idea is that if you can joke about it and if you can make it not such a big deal, then everything else that is one step escalated above it is also not such a big deal. Okay. So how do we change the conversation? I want to give you, a, um, you know, I want to wrap up this lecture by talking about positive directions forward and some things that have, uh, that some positive developments that have, that give us hope and that show that, you know, we are moving in a, in a direction that hopefully will lead to more gender equal representation in media and a move away from these kinds of gender stereotypes. In the past 20 years, there have been major strides in how women are portrayed in, in media. There are more, increasingly more women in media and behind the scenes, whether it's filmmakers, producers, um, working at studios, you know, d deciding what kind of content gets created. There are more media watchdog groups that are calling out and keeping an eye on the industry and you know, calling out these kinds of practices and saying, hey, this is unacceptable. Increasingly, there is more public awareness, discussion, debate, and advocacy within the, within the media industry and, and um, in society in general and between 
uh, media organizations and society. And like I said earlier, there are new avenues of research, particularly on media's effects on men and masculinity and media's effects on children. So I just want to give you a few examples of um, some, uh, some Western examples of greater diversity in media that we've been seeing over the past five years. So there has, there, we are seeing some greater diversity in media when it comes to women and minorities. So uh, these, these are all actresses that have become quite popular. Um, the first is Rebel Wilson and Amy Schumer on the bottom. They are both, but again, they are both comedians. Uh, so this idea, again, that fat is funny. So we are seeing larger women uh, that don't conform to the skinny white toothpick uh, ideal, but again, they're still stuck and they're still typecast in these comedic roles. On the right is an actress, um, uh, an actress and producer and writer named Mindy Kaling. She has her own show. It's I highly recommend it. I find it quite funny. And she's a woman of uh, Indian, uh, South Indian origin originally. Um, and, uh, but an American, uh, an American of South Indian origin. Um, and she has gotten a lot of critique and commentary because of her skin tone. Um, but uh, you know, she argues that if you don't see a clear path for what you want, sometimes you have to make it for yourself. And so she started out acting in other people's shows and was not happy with how she was being portrayed. And so with a lot of persistence and hard work and making good connections, she was able to uh, said, you know what, I'm just gonna make my own show. Um, and she did, and it's doing quite well um, in according to critics. There's also um, more diversity in terms of who's being represented in terms of LGBT, the LGBTQ community and alternative lifestyles. So the woman on the left is Rachel Maddow. She's a political pundit and commentator. She has her own show on, um, MSNBC, which is an American cable news program. The woman on the bottom is Laverne Cox. She's one of the most well-known transgender actresses in Hollywood. Um, and a quote from her says that, it, she says that it is revolutionary for any trans person to choose to be seen and visible in a world that tells us that we should not exist. So there has, the, so we are making some strides towards greater diversity in media. Um, there is still a lot that needs to be done. These are small steps forward, and these are, like I said, these are just a handful of, it, of examples. But they do, you know, point show that point that things might be going in a better direction, and that momentum is building to change the kinds of um, the kind of diversity that we see in the media, whether it comes to representation of men or women. In terms of advertising and how women are being portrayed in advertising, companies are listening and they are like wisening up to the fact that, that um, the extensive use of Photoshop and editing and uh, this unrealistic portrayal of women is, is not doing them any favors. Um, in two, this is just one example. In 2014, um, Aerie, which is the lingerie line of, uh, of American Eagle Outfitters, we have uh, um, a branch of this store right here on Hamda Street. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Um, but so it's a brand that is also sold, sold in the middle, across the Middle East. In 2014, they made the decision to stop photo, photoshopping and airbrushing uh, their models, and they chose to use real young women as opposed to models. Um, and it worked. Um, they, re they reported the following quarter a 9% increase in sales because women want to see models that look like them, right? It makes it more approachable. It makes the brand seem more understanding of what women, women want. Okay, the, the last thing that I want to talk about is just kind of say, so okay, so we have made some strides and these are the positive things that have happened. Then, and now I'm gonna talk about the, the, the areas that we, need to still, that we still need to work on and how we can demand change and break the cycle of um, you know, these very restrictive gender roles and the portrayal of women and men in the media. What, what we really need, first and foremost, is more participation of women in media production whether it's news or entertainment or, or um, policy, we need more participation of women in media production and behind the scenes. Um, we need greater industry regulation, influence, and, and we need to give greater influence to the power of, of watchdog groups to call out and to um, contribute to the conversation and um, you know, continue to keep an eye and, and mold and shape the way that the media uh, appro approaches these, these subjects. Um, increase awareness campaigns, obviously, and community initi initiatives. Um, the, the trailer for uh, the documentary that I showed you earlier, The Mask We Live In, is one really great example. 
I'm going to show you a trailer for the companion, uh, the companion documentary that focused on, on girls and females and uh, how the media contributes to female culture. Speaking of children. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, these two, I highly recommend both of these documentaries for anyone who is interested in this topic. I want to show you one more community-based initiative that, uh, excuse me. I'm going to show you one more community-based initiative. You know, so. Um, Community groups that have realized that this is having impacts, particularly on kids, have really, you know, have started to do a good job of, um, you know, addressing these issues and kind of teaching children that it's, you know, you don't have to conform to what you see in Disney movies or, you know, on TV or in cartoons. It's okay to be a little bit, uh, to be different than, than what is necessarily expected of you. I don't know if this is going to load. Nope, okay. Internet's not going to cooperate, it's fine. Um, the last two things that we really need to continue working on and to move forward are supporting positive role models, whether they be individuals or they be organizations. One really great example of an initiative um, you know, that works towards increasing the visibility and the role that women have uh, in, in Hollywood in particular is the Women in Film Fund, which gives money and funding and grants to female filmmakers. Again, consumer demand. If certain brands or corporations that you um, you know, formally liked or that you, you, you know, support to take particular steps or portray women or men in a certain way that you disagree with, don't buy their products. It works, I promise you, if enough people do it. I mean, look at, look at what the BDS movement has been able, the boycott, divest, and sanctions movement and, uh, you know, boycotting, boycotting Israeli products has been able to achieve in the past five, ten years. You know, uh, they're, they're considered a serious threat. So we can't underestimate the power that our, our wallets have to change the way that, that, the, that companies represent uh, men and women and the way that, you know, they use the media to do so. And obviously for the next generation, dialogue. Uh, as parents play a huge, and not the huge, the biggest role in changing the way that young boys and young girls um, are socialized into accepting these rigid stereotypes of feminin femininity and masculinity. Um, and you know, I would say it seems like a huge task and it seems monolithic and it seems like we can't move past it, but the first thing to do is just start, start with yourself, start with your friends, start with your family. And, and hopefully in 10 years time, we'll see a media landscape that looks drastically different in terms of um, media and gender. Um, thank you. So we have, I guess like what, five minutes for questions, I think, Libby? Yeah? Okay. Oh, well, thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, Actually, it's a comment uh, more than a question, uh, but we can't blame media all the time because media sometimes reflect uh, the culture and the social environment of a certain country, whether in the East or in the West. And sometimes uh, women themselves, they represent themselves as objects uh, and the focus will be on the body rather on the mind. So we can't blame media when presenting this image uh, for women all the time, because this is the situation in some uh, countries, uh, whether in the East or in the West. Absolutely, I completely agree with you. We can't choose just one institution or one aspect and put all the blame on it, correct? Media is a part of society, it's a cultural hallmark of society, and it's a cultural product of society. So there, there is a feedback loop between how societies um, you know, the society's, society's values and norms, what's reflected in the media, and then what's being 
broadcast back to the public. So I completely agree with you that um, you can't just say, oh, it's all because of the media. But the media do play a critical role, especially in changing uh, changing the narrative and changing the way we approach it. The other, as for your other comment, I completely agree with you that women are very often their own worst enemies. When we look at these women like Miriam Klink and Haifa Wahbe and all of these pop stars who are self-objectifying um, you know, and, and uh, Know, presenting themselves in such derogatory manners, yes, they are part of, of the problem for sure. Um, and and I would argue even within our own families. I mean, I'm half Lebanese. I grew up uh, in the U.S., but I live in a Lebanese culture. And you know, uh, from my studies that I've done on on um, on plastic surgery in Lebanon, um, young women and plastic surgeons both. Uh, say that um, you know the impetus to modify or focus on your appearance comes from mothers, from sisters, from cousins, from aunts. So it's within the the woman the woman community itself who is telling young women that the most important thing is about you is how you look, not what you're capable of, not what you're interested in, not not how how intelligent you are or what you want to do with your life. The f you know the first the the most important thing is how you look. So yes, we do need to encourage our own our own circles of women to start to change how they talk to to young girls, especially. Um, I have oh. yes. Um, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, she has she has the microphone. Okay. Yeah, uh, it is very sad that in our community, many justify the act of a rapist. If the man or woman were drugged, drunk, or wearing provocative clothes. And we have to be aware that that is wrong. There is nothing that justifies the act of a rapist. Uh, I, have another, uh, I have a question, which is, does a woman have the right to uh, choose to uh, objectify her body and herself? I, I believe in personal freedom, and if a woman wants to uh, objectify herself, that is her prerogative. Um, I would argue, however, that women who are in the public eye have a responsibility to the next generation that just if you want to sexually objectify yourself, you're not hurting anyone, right? It's your own body. You should be free to do with it what you want. But when you have young women who are looking at you as a role model or you are so visible in the public eye and there are young women and children and, and little girls who are seeing this um, pervasively in the media that then that that these same women then need to ask themselves if it was their daughter would they want them seeing these kinds of images تنميط المرأة اللي ذكرتي في المحاضرة كامل طبعا تنميط كسلعة ليست مشكلة وليت اللحظة ما السبيل إلى تغيير هذا التصرف الذي يقوم به عادة يعني مالكو وسائل الإعلام في مثل إنجليزي معروف من يدفع للزمار يحدد النغمة ومن الجانب آخر يعني حتى لو هذول يعني الوسائل الإعلام اتفقوا كلياتهم إنه ما نعمل تسليع المرأة نهائيا في راح يكون في مطالبات يعني على رأي إخوان المصريين الجمهور عايز كده. Okay, so um, I'll give a two-part answer. First, how can we change the subjectification of women? Um, well, uh, from from a media production standpoint and what the media are producing is to have more women behind the scenes, to have more women in management positions, to have more women in decision-making positions of what kind of content gets put on the air. That being said, um, there are many women who are in charge of media industries who still allow this kind of, who, who um, promote this, this, this narrative and promote the objectification of women because of the idea that sex sells. I would argue that the media's responsibility is not to give audiences what they think they want, but to give them what they need. That is the role of media as the fourth estate, um, is, is not to just, oh, this is what people want here, you know? And I understand that there's bottom line pressures and that media organizations want to make money, but at a certain point we have to ask, I think that it's the responsibility of media organizations to ask how much harm are they doing to society 
by only focusing on you know, the, the readings and the readership and the viewership and how much money they can possibly make uh, you know, by using these kind of sleazy tactics to gain, to gain, to gain uh, the kind of profits that they're looking for. Did I answer your question? Wait, wait for the translators. I can hear you, but not everybody else okay. can. Me. I think we actually need a new code of ethics for the whole Arabic world to regulate the media. Not to control, but to regulate. Absolutely, I agree with you. All right, it's coffee time. Thank you so much.